All right, should we get going? How is everyone? Good. Awesome. Anything exciting happened in the last few days? No wins, no successes. I just talked to a really great guy. Yeah. Um, he's like kind of a director of a great big firm back in Pennsylvania. He and his wife wanted to buy a second home here because their child's going to school here. Nice. And it was a really good time. Awesome. Good. Good job. That's great. Hopefully that'll turn into something good. Awesome. Cool. Good. Who else? Eric, come on. You gotta have something. Nothing. <laughs> All right. Oh, Very good. He's getting experience. I've been working with a customer that sold at home, but she is trying to plan on buying. So I've been trying to follow up, and she's finally going to get pre approval for my lender. And I guess the process started beginning of the month. Nice. Great. So I'm excited. Good job. That. Yeah, that's good. Great. Good job. Awesome. Who else? I guess that's it, huh? Okay, well, come on up, Jeff. This is Jeff with uh, Citywide. Hey, Jeff. Mm -hmm. Hi, everybody. I think you're all supposed to have, right? Yeah. Who are you, I'm Jeff? Having, yeah, I'm Jeff, remember? <laughs> um, we talked a while back, and maybe some of you weren't here when we talked about it. We talked about reverse mortgages a little bit. And um, what I like to do is bring to you guys current stuff that's happening in the market. Reverse mortgages, there have been people out there selling them that you could never lose your house and that live there for the rest of your life. Um, truth of the matter is you can lose a reverse mortgage house. You have an obligation to take care of the property, you pay your taxes and pay your insurance, and if it's not done, the home could be taken away from them. So that's one thing for any of you who are using reverse mortgages to try and move properties. There is a liability there. Remember, reverse mortgage is just a mortgage. It just accumulates interest instead of paying interest. So it has the same kind of rules and regulations, but you have an obligation to take care of the property and keep the tax insurance paid up on it. So if any of you are using those, and they're a great tool. Um, for that right, you know, someone over 62 years of age, there's a great way to buy a house, no doubt about it. Um, you have anybody in that age group who's looking to buy a house, have them at least consider the option of doing a reverse mortgage for the purchase. Um, great option. So. Any questions? Anybody doing anything on mortgages that are throwing you? Oh, what was the age group you said? 62 or older. 62 or older. And it's kind of a tricky thing because both, if they're married, both of them have to be over 62 because if one's over 62 and the other one is not, when the over 62 person dies, they're going to call the mortgage due. So you have to be very careful. We've had issues where you've had to wait for both spouses to be 62 so that they can get on the loan. Um, but you know, once they get in that, once they've covered that, you know, that, that remaining spouse could live thirty some odd years and never have to move out of the house as long as they maintain the property. So it's a really good way to sell. Anytime you have uh, people buying homes that are that age group, take a look at that option. If they have any money, any kind of money down, it's a great way to buy a house. So, anything else? I was just looking at reverse mortgage and I thought, man, I ought to ask you guys about that because I got a ton of questions, you know, how it, how it all works and everything. So there's probably... Yeah. I, I will tell you, I'm take. in the business, I will do a reverse mortgage one day. You know, I need to be old enough, but I will do one because I'm, I'm that convinced of their... You mean their for value. yourself? Yes. Oh. Yeah. I'm just convinced of that, of the value there. They're an amazing tool. But you have to have a certain amount of equity in your You do. Home. You do have to, and it's, it's one of those things that depends upon the age. If you go into a reverse mortgage right at 62, they're assuming you're going to live for a long time. So they're going to require a larger down payment to cover the interest that will accrue. But the older you get, the less down payment you have to have for a purchase. Um, you know, I'd say the most, it's, they run a schedule. It's, they have a calculator that does the required down payment. And right at 62, you know, you could end up putting you know, 45 or more, 50% down. But you start getting in the 70 years, 75, you know, you can get down into a uh, high 30% down. So in, in, anyway, you're, you know, it's like a, th a third down on the house, but you know, uh, it's, it's a really great tool for someone who owns their house and wants to buy another one. They can liquidate their house, take a third of that money, put it on the purchase of another one, take the other money and put it in their pocket. 
and never lose their house as long as they make their taxes. Yeah, I have a real quick question. So if you have somebody who has a reverse mortgage, is that money seen as income when it comes to getting another loan on another house? Well, okay, so you've got a couple of ways that you're going to take the money out of your reverse mortgage. One is in a lump sum, and the other one is, is money that comes on a monthly basis. What our requirements on our end is we have to look at the likelihood of money is going to continue. So we're looking for anywhere from two to three years, depending on the source of money, that we have to see that it's going to come. So yes, it can be taken as, as income, but if that, what is that person going to do? If they're moving out of that house, they're going to lose that reverse mortgage. You cannot rent out a reverse mortgage house. Oh, gotcha. they're, going to, they're going to see that, they, that you live in that house. One of the two of you has to live in that house. So if once both of you move out. What about in a divorce situation? Well, as long as someone stays in there, as long as one of the ones on there stays in that house. Okay. So, yeah. Now, I, I would, when you said it's a way to buy a house, Yeah. I, I've always thought the reverse mortgage, when somebody's had their house paid off, then they start getting money back monthly right. out of that. Um, How does someone buy a house with a reverse mortgage? Okay, have I got a second? Yeah. Okay, let me tell you about a, a, a situation we did It's for another someone. class. <laughs> well, but this will be a quick one. Okay. This is one that we actually did. I was involved in this one. I had a client that they lived in Sunset, Utah. Not a, not a high property value place. That house was worth about $130,000. So that's not a great house. You know, $65,000 of they're retired. They no longer have the ability to make the payment. Even though it's not a big payment, they owe 65000 Sold the house, took the equity. And because they were both advanced age, they took the equity, bought a brand new house, $230,000 house. In that area was a nice house. Put their equity on that house, they have no more house payment. So they went from having a house payment in a $130,000 house to no payment in a $230,000 house. Now, that equity is going to be eaten up more than likely over the next 20 years because the interest is accruing on the loan that they took out. Now, here's the cool thing in an appreciating market, it keeps up. Another person we did a reverse for, um, and they bought a house, and he comes back and he says, boy, I'd sure love to have moved to St. George, and now I'm stuck in this house. He says, no, you just have a payoff on your house. Bring me your bill. We looked at the bill. The loan had accrued interest since he bought the house, but the appreciation had exceeded the accrued interest. All I, I said, all you gotta do is pay off the loan. That reverse mortgage is just a loan. So as long as your appreciation it has over the last couple of years, it outpaced the interest that accrued, pay off the house, do reverse again. And the cool thing is the older you get, the less money you have to put down on your next purchase. So they're a great tool, but they are fairly complex. I would recommend that if you get a borrower or a buyer that is in that category, let's sit down and talk to them. And have, them in, have them talk to your loan officer because this is a fairly complex tool. And the truth of the matter is not all loan officers understand how to put those together. So make sure that you're dealing with someone who actually knows how to do them. Um, there will be some people who say, yeah, I can do it. No problem, let me do it. And they're not familiar with how they work. Our company does not allow just anybody to do a reverse mortgage. We have. I think two or three, two or three people in the whole company that allow to do them because they're a little tricky. Um, we have one of them that's in our office who uh, who does them. So, but make sure if you just if you get to that point, you have someone you feel like they're a good candidate, just have them come talk to us. And we'll we'll put some scenarios together and show them what's what's available for them. But it really is a great tool for anyone who has a little bit of equity. And we're hoping someone who's 62 and above has some. Quick question: man. Can you do a reverse mortgage on? multi-family unit if you live in one of the units? Yes, there are more qualifications than just that, but the answer is not a qualified, it's not just absolute no, but it's a little bit more complex than that, but yes, um, as long as you live in, that's gonna, and, and they're going to get a little bit, um, if you get above two units, they're going to get a little, you know, you're just of the business, but yeah. yeah. Anything else? Okay. Awesome. Let me use Thanks, Jeff. Good. Good. All right, Keely, come on. Hi, guys. Hi. Um, there are a couple familiar faces. If you're all familiar faces, I'm really sorry. We're going to all get the exact same information I've always given. Um, I'm with Vanguard Title. We're on the fourth floor. We work very close to the Century 21. Um, we are a title company. We are. Um, we have 
tons of experience in all areas from short sales to bankruptcies to your basic purchase, refi, everything. Um, we have lots and lots of resources that you can use. Um, as like getting farm lists, like if you wanted to do a mail out, we can help you get those addresses that you want. And we can also do phone lists that are put up against the do not call registry so you don't have to worry about calling people you shouldn't be calling. Um, we also have um, lots and lots of experience. Like I said, we have the, like the bankruptcy short sales. We also have an in-house counsel. We have an in-house underwriter um, that can help you with any questions that you guys may have. Um, in the, our Midvale office alone, because we have 11 offices from Centerville down to St. George, um, we have seven escrow officers in there, um, all with great teams helping them make sure that your deal gets the best attention it can. Um, and we also have multiple Spanish-speaking escrow officers, so if you get that Spanish-speaking client, we're able to help with that. We have one here, we have one in Centerville, one in Draper, and I believe we have one in Orem, not 100% sure. Um, but yeah, if you guys have any questions, we are we want to be a resource for you. We want to be able to help you build your business. If you want contacts, just anything, just let us know. Um, we'll see what we can do. Um, if you just go up to our office, I'm right around the corner, right in there. I can help you. Um, my contact info is right here. Yay, me. Um, and then our marketing director is one of the best there is, and she knows pretty much everything. She, I believe she originated as a loan officer before she landed the title, and she's fantastic. Um, so if you guys have any questions, um, go ahead and shoot me them my way. I can, if I don't know the answer, I can get you the answer. Um, otherwise, have a great day. Thank you. Awesome. And if anybody wants a flyer, raise your hand. I know I've given them out to a lot of people already. I'll just leave them Awesome. Okay. Well, good. So thank you. So uh, just as we get started today, so just as a reminder, so today's class and, and um, actually today and then the next four that we do are part of, you're kind of getting dual credit, so to speak, as you come to these classes. And what I mean by that is they're part of the peak agent training classes, so you'll get checked off as having attended for being here that way. But then also, um, I have gotten them approved to be part of the 12-hour new agent class as well. So as you come and attend and are here for today's class, next Tuesday, Thursday, then the next Tuesday and Thursday, uh, once we have done all five of those, then I can go and put on the division's website that you have taken the 12-hour new agent class. So the, uh, the thing, though, that I just want to make sure that everybody understands is to get credit for the peak agent training, you could watch the video because I, you know, all of these are recorded. But in order for me to give you the 12-hour new agent credit, you actually have to be live here today. In fact, uh, Dan texted me and was like, "I'm not feeling good today. Is it okay?" So now you guys are all excited to be sitting by him, right? Mm -hmm. Or I guess yesterday you weren't, right? But yeah. he's saying, "Can I just watch I'll it on?" Quiet. He said, "Can I just watch it though and still get credit?" But unfortunately, for the peak agent, yes. But for me to give you 12-hour new agent credit, no. You have to actually be live here. And as part of that, part of CE things, you have to be here live for 90% of the class as well. So just as we get started, I want to make sure everyone's clear on that. So Because if, if you miss either more than 90% or don't, aren't here live for those five, these today and the next four, then um, I can't give you the 12-hour new agent credit. So. Can exactly. we make up a one if we miss, like, on your next go around? So, yeah, which that's Since what... it's December. Yes. <laughs> that is what... Uh, that's what Dan actually is doing. Today's the... He okay. missed this one last time. Okay. And so that's why I said, yeah. So, um, anyway, so I'll keep track of that. But, yeah, until, until you've been live for him, unfortunately, for the 12-hour, I can't give you credit. So, so I'm going to pass around the roll. So the roll looks a little different today. And, and so I won't need, it's got a spot here for your name and license number. I don't need the license number every single time. So if you don't have your license number today, it's fine. But at least one out of the five times that you're here this, this week and the next ones, please bring your license number so I'll at least have it to, to put in. Sound good? All right. So any other questions on anything before we jump into this today? So did you just say it's this Tuesday, Thursday, next Tuesday, Thursday, and the next Tuesday, Thursday? So, yes. Yeah, so it, the last one will be the 22nd, December 22nd. Okay, but the there is one that Tuesday. I think when I email yes. 
there, that one wasn't on there. That Tuesday wasn't. Oh, really? It was weird. But, my bad. But if it I, is. If I didn't, yeah. yeah. So let me double check my count. It, let me make sure. Because that should be the way that I have it scheduled. So yeah, next Tuesday is the CMA class. Then Thursday would be the buyer packet. Uh, the 20th, so I may have left off the 20th as Repsy Workshop, and then the, the laws were on the 27th. So, all right, let me uh, pass these out. So this is going to be our worksheet we're going to use. Here. Okay, great question. So, um, did everybody hear what the question was? So it's 12 hour new agent class, but we're doing five two, two hour classes. So what happens is the, the division allows for, and you'll probably remember this from real estate school, a one hour class as far as the division is concerned consists of 50 minutes. So they allow for a 10 minute break for every hour and we don't take breaks. Okay. So, if, but if you equate that out, if we were to take breaks every 10 minutes on every hour after 10 hours would okay. be to, so that's how we get to that. Okay, right. now I'm really confused. So was Tuesday not part of this new agent? No, no. It really wasn't. Okay, I just need to know because I'm like, wait a second, that yeah. doesn't make any sense. Okay. Yeah, although you know what I think I'm going to do though actually is I think what I'm going to do next go around of teaching it, I am going to put that one in as part of the, so that it really is then 12 hours and then that allows for if you have to miss one or whatever okay. that it would uh, you'd still make the 90% or whatever. So, does that make sense? So, anyway, yeah, sorry, I must not have been very clear on not your here. email too, so I apologize. But it was good information, right? No, it was great. <laughs> All right, well, let's, uh, let's get going. So here's what we're gonna do. So part of what the division expects as part of, now remember, I'm trying to check off two boxes at the same time. One is to give you the 12-hour new agent credit, but then the other is also the peak agent training. So. So there are certain things that the division wants to make sure that are covered. So as we go through this, um, we'll make sure to point out those pieces to you so that we can check that box, so to speak, for the, the credit. But um, the other piece for me, really, what I want to accomplish really in terms of the peak agent training for you guys is being able to have you understand all the documents, um, how to fill them out, how to explain them, um, all of that. So please, as we go through this, let's talk about it and ask questions and, um, you know, Unfortunately, going through contracts can sometimes be kind of boring, so I'll do as best as I can to tell you some stories and stuff to try to make it fun for you. But, um, but again, my objective, though, of this is what I want to do is be able to have you guys being comfortable with the forms, understanding how to fill them out, how to explain them to the client probably is really even the better. So as we go through this today, my plan is not to necessarily, like, we're not going to go through and read every single thing and... and and we will, those who are here on Tuesday, we're not going to spend like an hour on one section. One, two, and three. <laughs> <laughs> Although I, as I'm saying that, I'm like, unless you guys all of a sudden have a ton of questions, then I might, I guess. But um, anyway, so that's kind of the plan, okay? So to go through this, answer questions, make sure you understand the forms that you need to use, all that. So today's is about with a seller. So as you're working with a seller, now, so this, this packet that you've got in your hand is not... Uh, the end all be all meaning it's there there every transaction is going to potentially have different things you may need so the, the this the idea of today in this packet is just kind of these are the basic forms that you're probably going to use just about every single time and then recognizing that under certain scenarios there may be additional forms that you would need to use so as an example of that um, on Tuesday Rob was talking about uh, short sales and if you were to go list a property that was going to be a short sale, then there's also a separate addendum that you would use as part of your listing agreement for that short sale. So does that make sense? Okay. All right, so let's jump through this. So what my plan is, is just we're going to go through and talk about each of the sections, what they mean, how you would explain it, that kind of thing, and then answer any questions you have. So uh, go ahead. Can we take notes on this? Absolutely. Yes, that is yours. Yeah. So... Um, so first thing, just that I like to point out, notice at the very top of this where it says exclusive right to sell listing agreement and agency disclosure, right underneath that it says, and a lot of times 
we don't think about this as we are filling out these contracts, but right underneath that it says this is a legally binding contract. Read carefully before signing. So you want to make sure to give your clients the opportunity if they want to, to actually read through these things. That's kind of where, for me, the nice thing with dot loop or is, or and or with a listing, is if you send over a, uh, a pre-listing packet to your clients and include this in there, gives them the opportunity, if they want to take it, to go and read through the entire um, forms if they wanted to. So uh, keep that in mind as we go through this and look at it is that uh, it, it's not a bad idea to, to get this to your client beforehand to allow them to take a look at it. Why else would that be good? Why else as part of like a pre-listing packet that we send to them, why would it be good to have this sent over? Carl? It gets them thinking that they're going to sign the contract. Okay, good. Why else? What else could happen as a result of you just sending it to them to take a look at prior to you getting it? Might sign it. Exactly. That's exactly right. Now they said they might actually sign it, meaning it's possible you show up to the house and they say, yeah, we went through and have everything signed and ready to go for you. We'll see you. Yeah, it makes, <laughs> makes your job that much easier, right? So if you've gone through and highlighted, here's the areas you'll need to sign and take a look at it. If you have questions, you know, let me know when I get there. So. Anyway, so that's exactly right. One of the things that could happen is you may get there and it may already be signed and ready to go for you, okay? All right, so next section. So the agreement is entered into on the effective day, or entered into effective the blank day of blank month and year. Obviously that, we're, we're starting with the real easy stuff, right? So everybody knows what you would put in there, right? The date you want it to be effective, right? So it's very simple. So typically, yeah, it's probably gonna be today's date, but um, anyway, so no questions on that, I assume. Um, next, though, it says, buy in between Century 21 Everest Realty, Realty Group, the company, and blank the seller. So we're going to put the seller's name in there, obviously, but where are we getting the information? How do we decide what we're going to write in there? Okay, so go to tax data, good. Where else could we go? To the title company, good. So the one thing that I'll tell you is don't just rely on the seller telling you who is on title. Always make sure you're checking that, okay? I had a time where uh, I had a guy that had gone out and gotten a listing, came back and turned it in. When he turned it in, it had one person's name on it. Well, come to find out when he ordered them the preliminary title report from the title company, which that is one of the things you want to do is as soon as you get a listing, go ahead and go to whatever title company you're gonna be using and or get the order started on the preliminary title report. When the agent got the preliminary title report and they looked at it, it had another name on it. Called up the seller and asked him, who is this? And he said, oh, it's my mom. Well, so the agent came to me and said, well, what do I need to do then? And what did he need to do? Yeah, we need the mom's signature as well, right? So I said, you need to go get the mom's signature. Turns out well, the mom was out of town and so he couldn't find the mom. The market was very similar to how today's market is, meaning that an offer showed up right away. He got another offer or got an offer on the property and I told him don't you know go ahead and negotiate it but make it subject to the mom being willing to sign because at that point we still hadn't tracked her down she was on vacation for like two weeks and turns out when we finally did get a hold of her the mom said no that's why I'm on title is because I bought the house yes I did it for him but I don't want him selling it and so I'm not gonna sign what, okay, I got a question. Stop there. What if the the mom, the mother, is the first on the title, and he's the second, and she dies? Does he become owner now of the home? No other person has to. So sign? it depends. The answer to that is it depends on how they're entitled. If they are on there as joint tenants, yeah. Then what happens with joint tenancy? So if, if it was joint tenants, then if the mom dies, it's just in his name only, he can do whatever he wants. If they had done it tenants in common, then now we got to, yeah, it's going to have to go through probate to, or see what happens on the will, all that kind of stuff. So yeah, great question. But yeah, and so it really doesn't matter who's first or second though, it's just how they're on title is what, what matters. Okay? Great question. All right. Um, 
Anything else on the seller line there? I guess, the, oh, I know what I was going to say. The other piece. So sometimes what will happen, is, in fact, I just helped my mom sell her condo. And in helping her sell the condo, the home was in her trust account. So if a property is in a trust, what do we also want to get from the seller? Okay, a copy of the trust staying who has the right to be signing on behalf of that. Which, so very similar to what Stephanie was just kind of asking, all along my mom has told me that I was going to be the, um, when she dies, I'm going to be the executor of the estate. So I assumed that if something happened to her that I was also then one of the trustees on the trust. But when, when I listed the property and said, okay, I need a copy of the trust so that I can turn it into the office, the title company is also going to want a copy of the trust. So I got a copy of her trust, took it to the title company, and as I was looking at it, I realized my sister was actually the trustee, which is fine. I, I mean, I'm glad to let her do it. That's fine. But um, it's, it's just that's the whole point is sometimes maybe what you think isn't really the case or even maybe what they thought they had put it as may not be. So we always want a copy of the trust saying who has the right to be signing on behalf of that trust. Uh, no, they, well, yes and no, but how title checks who can sign on the trust is by asking for a copy of the trust, which I've seen actually um, situations where, and I'm trying to remember, this was a, a while ago, but I had somebody that I had, was helping them sell their dad's house. He was still alive, uh, but the trust that they gave us when I took it to the title company, it was an old, old trust, and so they did want to do some checking to make sure is there a more current one so but they relied on the seller to provide that so and, and I think if I remember what ended up happening is they ended up actually kind of redoing the paperwork to make sure that because uh, well there was a problem with the name like one had an initial and then the middle name and one had the first name and an initial initial middle name so anyway so somebody else had a question well, when we've done it before, when I pulled it, when it's been in a trust name, the executor is listed as the owner, usually on title. So sometimes you don't even need a copy of the trust, right? If it's already been. Uh, I'm actually the not. Title. Well, it, I guess if it was recorded, yes, that's it's true. Recorded. So if it is recorded, they could find that. But it, if it's but not recorded, if it's not, then, then yes, you would need it. Yeah. That's why you always record it. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Which that's just it. A lot of times people will set up a trust and then they actually never even actually put the property into the trust, too. So. There. Cautious not to take up your time, but do Good they need question. the whole? Because I mean, mine's like this. Do they see the front page? Or? They just need the section that is going to say who has the right to be signing on on behalf of the trust for the properties and things. So, yeah, great <coughs> questions. <coughs> Awesome. All right. Good. So, so everybody, we're good on where to, what to put up there in the cellar and making sure that we have the right, or excuse me, all of the signatures from any of the sellers. So if for some reason. So the other reason I'm a little hesitant on the tax records is I've seen them be wrong as well. And so, and also I've seen also where if maybe if there were three people's names on there, a lot of times if you're just pulling it up at least off the MLS, it gets cut off. So it really is a good idea to, to just make sure you're double checking with title as to who currently is on title to the property. Yep. Question? No. Okay. All right, next, terms of the listing. So the terms of the listing is the seller's granting the, the company including, and then you're going to put obviously your name there as the seller's agent, right? Uh, as authorized agents on behalf of the company, and then it, it's ending at and, and this is crucial to keep in mind here. This says it ends at 5 p.m. on blank day of month of year. So how long do we want to put in there in terms of our date for our listing? Six months. Six months. Okay. Most of the time, that's what it's going to be is six months. There are going to be times, though, where maybe it's a, a property that is a two or three or four million dollar property or higher or whatever that it may take longer than and you may want to do a year and a half or even two years or something like that so that's the whole point of why we leave a date in there is so that you can it doesn't have to be exactly six anything less than six though I would say to be be cautious a little bit with that on, on doing less than six months just because you end up doing a ton of work on a property and then you want to make sure that it has time to be marketed and, and sold. So, okay, uh, let's see. Next blank line down there is also the, the 
described as for the property, which again, we want to make sure to just put the address of the, the property in there, right? Okay. Any questions on that section? All right, next, brokerage fee. So in this brokerage fee section, in here is where it's saying what our commission is going to be. You'll notice as you read through there, it says that the brokerage fee is going to be 7% with an, of the acquisition price plus 295 administration fee. Now, we have a number of different contracts available. So we have these available that are at 6% and 7%. And then as far as the admin fee, the 295 is the minimum that we're going to require in terms of an admin fee. You can charge higher than that if you want in terms of an admin fee and, and collect it. And then what happens, and, and I want to be real clear on this because sometimes agents will, get, will mess this up. That admin fee, so the 295 is just going to go to the company. Okay, So that's just to the company. Anything you charge above that is then going to be given to you on your split. A lot of times agents miss that piece of it and they think that if they charge a 595 or a 590 fee that that then allows them to pay the 295 plus a 295 for to cover their uh, transaction coordinator if they're using transaction coordination. But you got to remember what whatever split you're on is how that additional administration fee will be split between you and the company. Okay. So don't, otherwise you get your check and you'll be like, oh, well, I charged a 595 because I was thinking it would then cover the transaction fee with the transaction coordinators. And 595 is not going to quite be enough, depending again on what split you're on. I mean, if you're on a 50-50 split, it's only covering half of it. So it just kind of depends. So what sometimes people will do is instead of a 595, they'll do the 695. Then that way, even on your split, you're probably still going to be be covered unless you're on a 50-50 then I guess it's still not quite but pretty close. Make sense? Sorry. What questions? So we know where the 295 has to be done so we can charge more? You can charge more than that if you want. Like, uh, So are they doing, the, the TAs doing more work? The TCs? No. No, it's the same work. You're only paying them 295. So, like for an example, um, I don't know how many of you were at Summit in November. How, how many were there? So, do you remember Lou talking and how much did she yeah. say she was charging? She's done the 995. So, 295 of that goes to the company, and then the additional $700 on that then is just between getting split on whatever her split is with the company. Does that make sense? So. So the additional is just... Well, I'm just wondering what is it that they do for that extra, you know, you're paying 300 what goes in... The TCs are only still getting 290 If you're using a transaction coordinator, they're only getting 295 regardless of what you charge. Okay. So if you charge more than that, then you just, it's on your split. Does that make sense or not? Sort of, yeah. Anyway, I don't want to dwell on the 295 thing. Well, does, that, does, it, does everybody, if you have questions, I want to cover it, but if, if you're the only one, you and I can work on it afterwards. Does anybody else have? You, you're good. This, this is, the, you almost always will spend the, the, usually the bulk of the time on that. Nobody's got any issues? Okay. All right, cool. Awesome. So when is it all due then? So we're, this is what we're charging, but when, when is it due? On the settlement. So we'll get it at closing, right? So it'll be on the settlement statements, yes, but you're going to get paid at closing. Okay, good. So that's what this is saying is that we're going to get paid that. Now, what about, though, what if the person says, well, what if I find the buyer myself? What if somebody comes and knocks on my door and wants to buy my house? Do they still owe the commission and everything? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, good. So I had that actually situation happen with a friend of mine where I had put the sign out, another neighbor uh, had a friend and they said you ought to go buy the house so the friend just and the neighbor walked over knocked on the door and just said hey they want to buy your house and the seller came to me kind of feeling like hey you didn't find the buyer that I didn't find the buyer because the next door neighbor did but who really found the buyer your sign, you did. yeah your my sign. sign really I mean without the sign out there they would know not have even known so right yeah so really so just keeping in mind, this is saying regardless of who comes up with the buyer or anything, we're, we get paid the commission. Okay? 
All right. Next, the protection period. On that blank line, what do we put there? If within what? Okay, so I heard three, what did you say? Six. six. Yeah, so I would say somewhere in that range between a three and a six is pretty good. Um, on this, here's how I think about the protection period on this. I think about it as in terms of this, the purpose of this section is to keep honest people honest, is really what that section is about because the truth is, I mean, more than likely, well, let me back up. What this is saying is that if so many months after the expiration date, which is up in section one, that if they were to sell the property to somebody you had shown it to or during the time of our listing, we would still get paid a commission if they buy it. Okay? So the purpose of this section is just to protect that so that once we're coming down to like the, the last couple days of the contract, it keeps the seller from being able to say to a buyer, hey, if you wait a couple days and come back, I can give it to you for a little cheaper because we don't have an agent involved. So that's what this section does. But Again, for me, I just think of it as it's really just going to keep honest people honest because most of the time, if you have a property that expires, unless it's your neighbor or something, you're probably not like keeping track to see did they sell it or not. Does that make sense? So, anyway, so that's a protection period. So, wait, so Go what ahead. do we put in what there? What would you put in there? Somewhere between three and six months is what I would typically say is to put in there. So, if I call an expired listing, then I go and get the uh, property relisted. Oh, great question. So the first agent still gets a commission even if somebody three months ago comes back? And great question. Yeah. So the only exception to that is going to be if the property is relisted. So if the property were to be relisted with another agent, so now they're subject to a commission on that end, right. then um, you're not going to get paid. Question. So, not all listing agreements from different brokers have that in there, do they? Um, I would say most do. Yeah, I was going to say, I don't know if I've seen one without, but... Um, but they don't have to have it. So typically what most companies have done, so this is ours, but typically it's modeled after. Almost everybody yeah. takes the MLS one yeah. and then they modify it to kind of fit. So typically, so, but I would say most of the time I've seen with other companies where the blank line actually has a number of typically six months in there, saying if within six months. So anyway. for what it's worth, but I would just say for me at least three, and somewhere around that three to six. And if you wanted to just say six, you could do that. So. I got a question for Let just, know a, I can't talk just a quick one. <laughs> the brokerage right. fee, seven percent. Is it seven or six? Yes. Okay. Seven or six. Okay, so <laughs> or okay, eight so or nine. When we get this printed out, is it always going to pop up at seven? No. Or? So that's what I was saying. Is there there are multiples on dot loop? There are multiples of these contracts. They're, they have six, they're 6% with 295, 6%, 395, 6%, okay. 495, and then 7% with all of those as well. So you have the choice. Okay. I, part of the point though is, is don't just assume, I think Lou at, at uh, Summit was a perfect example again. Of, don't just assume, well, I have to do 6%. I mean, because you potentially could do a 7% or an 8 and she even brought up she has done a 12. You know, charge somebody 12%. Yeah, well, and also when you put your Yeah. That doesn't really give you much room, but if you put it at seven and you're willing to go down to six, then that gives you some bargaining. You know, yeah, perfect example. Yeah, perfect example. Is that that's just it. If you'll start it, and, and again, remember what I was saying. If you've sent this as part of a pre-listing package and it was seven percent and five ninety-five or six ninety-five, and you got there and they've already signed it, great. I mean, yeah. So yeah. it gives you some room to negotiate of, of, you know, if you need to. So. So it's kind of up to you on that, but uh, anything less than 6%, you need to get permission to, to do. Otherwise, we're going to look at it and say, you're taking the hit on that, the difference below. Make sense? All right. Any other questions on that, the protection period? Okay, good. Next, seller's warranties and disclosures. So the seller's warranties and disclosures, this is where we are warranting to them, excuse me, I said that backwards. The seller is warranting to us as the company that number one, they have the ability and that they are the owner of the property. So they're warranting to us that they are who they say they are, but they're also agreeing in here that they will fill out our seller disclosures, 
they will disclose to the potential buyers everything they know about the property. So in this section, that's what, as you, if you were to read through here, I mean, it's, it gives a little bit more than that. But essentially, if, you were, if I'm sitting down with you as the seller and I'm explaining it, that's what this section is really hitting on the most, is that they are the owner of record, that they uh, will disclose, that they are agreeing they'll fill out our seller disclosures, and they will disclose everything that they know about the property to any potential buyers. Sound good? And what if they don't? Like termites or something that they didn't know, maybe as the well, seller. They don't know. They they don't know. know. Yeah. yeah, if they don't know, they can't disclose. But on the seller disclosures, which we'll get to here in a minute, it is saying this to their knowledge, this is what they know. So if they don't know, then it's going to be fine. But if they know there's termites and they don't disclose it, they could have some issues. What if they know and they don't tell you? Well, I never knew that. If they don't tell you as the agent? Yeah. Well, well after the whole thing closed and then the the buyers that buy the home complain, hey, there's termites. I never knew that I had termites. Well, if they said that, so I guess as long as the neighbor doesn't... I know it's dishonest, well, yeah. I'm just so going, people are... Dishonest, yeah. So um, typically what happens, this is a great example, is typically what will happen is when the bu new buyer moves in, one of the neighbors will come over and say, so what are you going to do about the termites? Yeah. What if they don't have somebody that's next door that's going to come over and tell? Well, then, it, it, yeah, if they don't know, I mean, if nobody comes and tells them and they go discover it, then yeah. they've got to somehow prove that the, the, the seller, seller did know. Okay. I mean, so, yeah, they'll end up in court. And if they can prove the seller did know, then the seller would be liable on that. So if they can't, then, you know, buyer beware. Yeah. So, all right. Next, agency relationship. So when I get to this section with the seller, typically what I will do is just explain to them that um, this agency relationship is explaining how agency works, okay? So we're gonna spend a little bit of time on this uh, in terms of what the division wants you guys to talk about in this in a second here. But how I explain it to the seller is this section here in section five is explaining how agency works. So section 5.1 is talking about the duties of a seller's agent. So I'm, I tell the seller, I'm gonna be representing you as your agent, meaning I'm on your side of the table. I'm there to do everything I can to help you achieve what it is you want to, get the most money, you know, get out, get moved out whenever you need to, whatever it is, but I'm on your side. I always wanna make sure that I'm letting them know I'm here to represent you. Your best interest is my best interest because Sometimes it feels like the seller thinks you're there to, to negotiate against them, and that's not really true. I want them to know I'm there to represent you, to give, help you accomplish whatever it is that you're wanting to accomplish out of this, and I'm on your side of the table. I'm not, we're not negotiating against each other. We're doing this hand in hand, going there together, okay? And then 5.2 talks about the duties of a limited agent. So in terms of a limited agent, th at this section is what we're telling them is, and it says, the seller understands that the seller's agent and the broker may now or in the future be agents for a buyer who may wish to negotiate a purchase on the property. So in that scenario, we're, we're going to end up being a limited agent. Now, so what does that mean? If we're going to be a limited agent, what is, what do, what? So you're both the buyer and the seller's agent. Okay. Good. Creates an issue. I had a fr I had my son's realtor did not tell him he was representing the seller. So the seller came in, or the buyer came in without a an agent. Anyway, I was in the middle of classes and stuff, and I had just gone over this, and I was talking to him, and he's like, and I'm like, what do you mean he's representing? I said, is he representing your buyer? And he goes, well, yeah. So he said, and I said, did you sign something that said that was okay? He's like, no. And so we, my husband called him and said. We know you're in breach of your duties to our son as the seller. Anyway, they had to work out some issues with the commission because he was totally being dishonest to him. And it was like, <coughs> and he's young. My son's 25 and didn't know any of it. And the only reason I knew was because I was just, just doing taking class. that class. And that was the section we were going over. So it's mm -hmm. kind of tricky. And I, it's, I think sometimes it gets snuck through there because, the, you know, the general public doesn't, doesn't know, know. That yeah there's so an issue. which great point so what the division requires though so one is for the seller we're disclosing to the seller here that it's a it's a potential issue 
And part of why we want to do that is because we want to know if they're not okay with that, I want to know right now, because what would we do if they're not okay with it? Get another agent. Yeah, so, but, so for me though, if the seller said, I'm not okay with that, I would begin by saying, well, what that means then is I can't show your house. Meaning if a buyer calls and wants to go see your house, I can't show it to them. I'm, I'm going to have to find somebody else to do it, which typically you can help them to see that it, it's not going to be that big of a deal. And, and I'll, I'll help you through in some of that in a second here. Yeah? Um, I did take this class. But <laughs> it was when Lou was saying she charged the 995. Yeah, but it wasn't part of the 12. I had, didn't have the 12 hour new agent approved at that time, right. so it didn't count. Sorry. Okay. That's why you're here. I promise. <laughs> I'm not trying to make you suffer, dude. <laughs> I should have you come teach it then. If I was a little bit. <laughs> you would. Yeah. All right. So in terms of the limited agency then. So because of that, the division then also requires, if we're going to end up being limited, so this is where what you were talking about, is there's a separate form we have to use. So sometimes though agents will think, well, no, I told the seller here and on the buyer agency when it does talk about limited agency. And so they may have been thinking, well, no, you signed it on both those, but that's not good enough. There's a separate limited agency form that any time you are going to be representing both, they have to. But what else is, does it require? When else is that required? Because it's not just if you only are representing both buyer and seller. When else would you need it? Someone else. Same brokerage. brokerage. Yeah, so if it's the same brokerage. So if, if the listing agent is with Century 21 Everest and the buyer's agent is with Century 21 Everest, you're going to need it then as well. Okay. So what if, though, it was with a different Century 21 that wasn't part of Everest? Would we still need limited agency because it's Century 21? No. Separate. Correct. Good. Separate. Yeah, so it really boils down to that principal broker. And if it's the same principal broker on both sides, we need the limited agency form. If there's a different principal broker, we don't. Okay. So really, you're just looking at for Century 21 Everest. If you see that, we need limited agency. Okay. Is there a... Is there a separate form that is required by the commissioner for disclosure of what types of agency that we could offer? No. Okay. No. There's a separate form if you're going to be acting as a limited agent, but if you're not, then this is it. Okay. These are the you only. You don't have to explain it to them upon first sight or uh, meeting of uh, the types of agency. Showing a house. Good question. So, we, which that is actually one of the division questions they want you guys to know. So, when do you have to disclose who you represent in a transaction? I mean, do we have to do it like the moment they walk in the door? Do I have to, or can I? Do I have to be like, oh, I'm sorry, you can't even come in this house until I tell you that I'm representing the seller? With the Okay. Any other ideas? On first meeting. So I guess that's the question though. So you say upon first meeting, but does that mean I can't let them in the door until I tell them? Right. Or yeah, well, what? In, in some states, that's, that's the case. That you can't let them in the door? Well, you, upon first meeting, like on the hood of your car, you say, wait a minute, before we go in, I've got to give you some information. you got to read the whole disclosure as to what types of agency there okay. are and what this means. Yeah, we don't have that form. I'll, there are some companies who use that form. I know what form you're talking about. It's not a requirement by the state. But here's what the state has said is as soon as it you reasonably can. So again, they're not saying that like you can't not even let them in the house until you have discussed agency. But I would say probably on that first meeting, yes, you need to explain it at least at some point but it doesn't have to be like immediately it, but you do need to let them know and especially probably the biggest red flag would be so using your scenario with like your son as soon as you can tell that if it's your listing as soon as you can tell this buyer is getting some interest and they're going to start to now tell you information that maybe they wouldn't want to tell you knowing that you represent only the seller is, is the time to let them know, look, I, I am representing right now only the seller as the seller's agent. I can represent you where I would be representing you and the seller as a limited agent, but I've got a separate form that we'd fill out if we're gonna do that. 
but I just want to make sure you are aware that I do represent the seller. So anything that you tell to me at this point would be then information the seller would get to know as well. So let's, that's a good spot to pause. So what are those? So as we go through, we talk about um, the duties that we have as a, an agent and as a seller's agent or a buyer's agent. What are those fiduciary duties? Loyalty. Okay. Loyalty, obedience, disclosure, care, okay, reasonable care, accountability, good job. Okay, so when we're representing somebody, these are the fiduciary duties that we have to that client, is com full confidentiality, obedience, the, the full loyalty to them, full disclosure, reasonable care, and accountability. So what, let's, what ex what's confidentiality? What does that mean? If you know so, they're desperate to sell, you're not letting people know. Okay, good. So if they, yeah, if they, if they are saying, look, we're going to lose the place if we don't sell it yes we can't tell that but what about though let's use Stephanie's example let's say okay we've had um, termites but don't you don't tell anybody oh, you have the so you have to be you got to keep everything confidential that I tell you and I know that so you can't uh, tell one of your other so why do we have to tell you can't you won't sell it if that is told to you and you're not supposed to reveal that fact okay so possible buyer no. So, so what, how come we have confidentiality, but now you guys are telling me I can't? Because we're supposed to be honest. The other party. Okay, good. Yeah, that's right. We still have. We still owe to the customer the the honesty piece of it, right? Okay, good. So what about obedience? What if they're asking me to do something that they want to do a double contract? They they say, okay, let's do. Uh, we want to do a situation where we found somebody that wants to buy the house, and we're going to do seller financing for them. So, which actually, uh, this happened quite a bit back in the late 90s. What would happen is somebody would come in and say, I'll use an easy math number on it for you. Let's say the home was listed at 80000 Somebody would come in and say, Steve, I want to buy your listing. I'm going to give you 100000 I know you're listed at eighty, but I'm going to pay you 100000 What I want to do, though, is I want you to do seller financing for that 20000 between the eighty and $100,000. i will go get a loan for 80000 you finance that twenty thousand, and and I'll buy your house. Okay. So yeah, notice how we yeah great. I'm fine with that, right? <laughs> now, why would somebody want to do that? Why would I, as a buyer, want him to do that for me? So you can use Perhaps. the money the way you want. You that extra twenty thousand. So that I get to use the extra twenty. I'm right. not going to get Wasn't it. Wasn't that your you intention? Don't have down payments. Yeah, essentially, it's a way for me to buy the his house with zero down, but. Why? Why would I want to do it that way instead of going through Utah Housing or something? Taxes. Not taxes. If I put less than 20% down on a property, what typically am I going to have to have? Mortgage insurance. But doing it this way, I put 20% down, sort of, on his property, so I get rid of mortgage insurance. My loan's at $80,000. i have got 100% financing. Now, what I left out was the agreement that we were going to have, Steve, is I'm not after we close, you're going to forgive that note. So I'm not really going to pay you the $20,000. you are just going to forgive the note afterwards. Yeah, so that's loan fraud, right? So, but if the seller asked me to do that, but one of my fiduciary duties is to be obedient, right? So I got to do it, don't I? Why? I can't break the law. Okay, yeah, we're not, yeah well, as long as it's legal, we'd be right. Okay, so loyalty, obviously we got to be loyal to them. Full disclosure, we kind of talked about that with there, the reasonable care and accountability. Okay, so in a limited agency situation, though, what goes away? In this scenario, let me see if it has the answers here you for you. You have to divide, undivided, what con confidentiality, loyalty, and disclosure equally between the two parties. Sorry, say that again. I was looking. Well, it says you have to divide, have undivided, between the two parties, you have to divide the confidentiality. Okay, so yeah, we can't. 
We can't be fully loyal to one side or, or the fully other. Fully confidential or fully disclosure. Okay. Is that it? Look in section, in that section. I was trying to see if I could find it real quick. According, According to, to your paper, paper, yes. Confidentiality According to what? This paper, that is. Okay, good. Paper. That's what I was, I was making sure. I don't know where loyal, loyalty goes away. Well, you're dividing your loyalty. Yeah, it's divided. It's not going away, it's just that you're still loyal. You're yeah, so it, they're limited. Your loyalty is limited is yeah. probably well, which is maybe why. maybe because I wouldn't tell the seller something that the buyer told me. Yeah, so yeah, here's where it says, because the agent cannot provide to both parties undivided loyalty, confidentiality, and disclosure. So yeah, go ahead. Um, and remind me your name. Jeff. Jeff, that's right. So sorry not to get off on a path. I had an experience last week, and I and this is, it's just kind of bringing up that experience. Sure. So I just have a question. Um, I was under contract with, with some buyers um, throughout the process. So the buyers, he's a general contractor. He models homes for a living, that's, that's what he does. So we've, we bought a home, went under contract with it. During the due diligence, he went in and did the inspection on the home and found a whole lot of other stuff that we weren't able to see the first time we walked through the home. And on the verge of some of it almost looking like it might have been covered up by the seller, mm -hmm. but not really 100%. Worth. It's one of those things where you really can't say, hey, look, you're trying to fraud us yeah. type of a deal. Right. So we weren't able to, after the, during the due diligence period and after the inspection, we weren't able to come to terms on the home. We just, we ended up being about $20,000 away and weren't able to come together. So canceled the contract, still looking for another home for this person. Two days later, just out of just a, a free coincidence, I get a lead who wants information on that same home. So I start talking to this gentleman. He starts asking me questions. I revealed to him, hey, I actually know this home. You know, we were just under contract with it, blah, 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 blah. And the second those words left my mouth, I went, oh, no. He's going to start asking me questions that I don't know if I can answer. Yeah. Um, come to find out, he's already working with another realtor. Oh, OK. So in the middle of this conversation, at that point, when he starts asking me questions about the inspection, about what was found, we found asbestos, we found lead, we found, I mean, what can I say? I, I, it, it put me in a position where I started really, really walking on eggshells because I was afraid of messing up this deal for this other realtor, for yeah. both of the other realtors, yeah. by saying something that I wasn't 100% sure because the inspection was done actually by my client. <laughs> yeah. So, so, but it's not your listing, right? No. It is not okay. my listing. Good. So, because if it, so, I get if it was your listing and your seller was saying, "Well, don't tell." You, I would say you still have to because now you knew there was those issues there. But because it's not your listing, you you owe no, none of these fiduciary duties to, to either of those parties. Correct. So I'm okay to just say whatever? Yeah, that's what I would now, say. About, now let me ask you this. So legally I'm okay to say whatever. Ethically, what, am, what should I do in that situation? From one realtor to another realtor, I mean, what's the right play there to just kind of say, hey, if we just weren't able to work it out. We found some things like the hole in the roof and point out the obvious stuff and don't bring up the other stuff? Or Great question. So here's what I would say on that. Ultimately, so uh, it's a great question. Thank you for bringing it up. Who does he owe these to? So, to your client. To my client, right. So because of that, because the, uh, you know that information and things through your client, really, here's, and I, I'm not 100% that I'm right, so if somebody has a differing opinion, please say. But I, the way I think of that is, in order for you to disclose any of the information that you knew about that house and the, and the inspection and everything, you need permission from your client yeah. to do that would be the first thing. Okay. So now if your client said, yeah, I, you know, go ahead and tell them, then I think it would be totally fine for you to tell that other agent, we canceled because we did an inspection and we found these issues on the house and we, it was just more than we wanted to deal with, so we canceled it. But the key to that is having permission from your client because you have the confidentiality and, and, not, to, and not disclosing information on him. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So there was a different buyer and seller's agent? Yes. Yes. Well, different buyers, it, it, it was somebody else's listing and the, a buyer called him, but it turns out they had a, a different agent. Oh, I just... I just direct it back to the other agent. Well, and that's what and that's what I was trying to do, but he started asking questions. Yeah. You know, why did yeah, it go through? What yeah. did you? And like I said, as soon as I opened my mouth and said, "Hey, 
after the inspection, I was like, oh, why did I say that? Well, and I think you're fine to have just said after the inspection we changed our mind, but then as far as getting into the details, I would say at that point, if they were asking you, you'd have to say, I need to go back and ask my client if they're okay with me telling you that. Well, just because I think I've just learned from experience that when you can not say anything, you're better off. I think I would probably just say, yeah. you chose not to have a problem with them. Because sometimes somebody can find something wrong and their opinion is wrong, but in another person's opinion, it's not wrong. In fact, a perfect example of that, now that as you're saying that, on my mom's condo, I told you I just helped her sell her condo. The buyers did their inspection and came back and said there was a problem with the water pressure in the house and they wanted a plumber to come out and fix it. So I called the plumber, he came out, changed out the pressure release valve, everything's, he tested it, everything's great. They went back in and said, you didn't fix the, the problem. So I called him and said, hey, I don't know if it was a bad valve or what, but apparently there's still a problem with the pressure. He came back out, we checked the pressure again. He's like, it's fine. I'll change out the valve anyway, just because he's a friend of mine. That, and when I say friend, meaning I've used him for 20 years to do plumbing stuff. He said, for you, I'll change it out, put in a new valve, put in a new valve. We tested it again. I even took the same pictures the agent sent to me to show that, look, the pressure didn't change when I turned on water or whatever. And then now, uh, I just got a call two days ago that the buyers have now moved in and they're like, there's still a problem with the water pressure. I, I called the plumber. The <laughs> yeah, I called the plumber and he said, I think it's a volume problem, not a pressure problem. And uh, anyway. So yeah, differing opinions. I mean, in their, their mind, there's still a problem. And are my plumbers and my moms is like, no, we've done everything to, to fix it. So I would kind of agree. I mean, I probably think you're probably better off leaving it to all, you know, as they ask questions, the excuse of using, I've got agency with my client and I would have to get permission to disclose any of that to you. But I, I would agree with what Daryl said. You're probably better off to just let her, let them do their own due diligence. but. I get it is a tough spot though because well, you because you're like I would want somebody to tell me if they had done well, all like that. Like I said, as soon as I, that came out of my mouth, I I, I was like, oh, I should shouldn't have said that. that. <laughs> I know he's going to start asking questions. Yeah, exactly. You know, yeah. In my intention would have been just don't say anything yeah, about it. Exactly. So, yeah, exactly. So. In his case, where his his you were the buyer's agent, correct? Right. You're looking out for this buyer, uh, and he's a contractor. Maybe this contractor wants no one else to buy the house and therefore he could buy it and fix it up but wouldn't you know why wouldn't you tell somebody well i just think what daryl's saying i would agree with i think you're really just better off to let them do their due diligence because that there is definitely some of those things that are maybe subjective as to is was it really asbestos or did they just assume it was did they did they test to see if it was asbestos yeah Okay. Well, he said, see, that's just it. It's all hearsay. I mean, he said that he did a test on it. Okay. He said it was his best. And the lead and the paint as well, too. Yeah. That should have all been on the listing, right? The lead thing should have been on the listing agreement. Well, the lead is, yes. so the lead well, based sure and lead is just that it could be. Yeah, I was going to say that the lead, we'll get to the lead based disclosure in here, but that's very, like, the very last thing we'll do. So are you okay if we hold till then? Oh, I'm And I'll no, answer them? Okay. okay. That's but, totally good. So, yeah, they should have disclosed if they knew, but okay. Okay. Nope, you're good. What else? Awesome. Okay. So in terms of the agency and stuff, everybody's good, understands all this. There is going to be a test on that. <laughs> Not today, but... How about an exclusive right to sell? Is that in here? Sorry, Say that again. Exclusive right to sell? <laughs> what about it? Is that in this contract or is that a different one? No, that is. That's this one. It's the name of it. And it... Okay. What makes it that is up in the brokerage fee of just saying basically regardless of how the buyer shows up, where they come from, we're still going to get paid. We okay, get paid. so where does it state that if if you find a buyer, you don't have to pay a commission to the realtor? Uh, nowhere in this contract. Okay, in this one. Okay. Because this is exclusive, right? We get paid no matter what. Right. Okay. That's a separate contract. Yeah, it'd be a totally separate. What would that contract be called? Well, you're never going to use it, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> but my husband does. Oh. Oh, okay. Yeah, there you go. So I, I'm just curious, okay, so well, how do you get to do that? Well, so, so here, good, good question. Involved? So occasionally you'll come across maybe a for sale by owner that says, yes, I want to list with you, Eric, but 
I got these other people that I've shown the house to, and if they buy it, I don't want to have to owe you a commission based on what this is saying. Right. Okay. Is that kind of more what same, you're meaning? Same idea. Okay. Yeah. So with that yeah. idea, then what you would do is you would do an addendum to our listing agreement, where what you would do is you would exclude those people. So you would just say just um, those people. just those people, right. and I recommend doing it for a certain amount of time, not just these people are excluded forever from this, but saying. For the next 30 days or 45 days or something like that, 60 days, if, if these people buy the house, then we, you would not be subject to the commission. So, so really, that's the only time you would be using it, is to say if they, these particular people buy it. Because otherwise, again, it's back to the example I used. My neighbor, when I listed their house, and then the other neighbor had a friend that went over and bought it, who found the buyer? Did I find the buyer? Or did they find the buyer? Your sign, your sign. My sign is who procured the buyer, right? So really, did I find the buyer for them? Yes. Yeah, even though in their mind they were thinking, well, you didn't even do anything yet. I mean, you would just put the sign in and a day later these people showed up. They hadn't even hit the MLS yet. So in, if you did what you were talking about, where saying if they found the buyer, they would have come back to me saying, we found the buyer. But did they really? I would say no. It was my because if they wanted to do that, they should have put a for sale by owner on a sign out first before contacting me to come list. Does that make sense? It does, except that there's a totally different situation with Ron. So I'll, ex okay. I'll explain. Okay, we'll do it. Later. All right. Are you still friends with him? Oh yeah, once very good friends with him still. Oh, yeah. okay. I was going to say yeah, yeah, once in a while. <laughs> oh, with your husband? No, he was talking to me. Yes, I'm still very good friends with him. Right? Well, that's good. Somebody else had a question I thought. No. Okay, next page. Hey, it only took us an hour to get through the first page. So, how many pages are in here? Is that one? We'll be here for hey, you know, we can 12 hours, whatever. So, all right. So, we'll, we'll pick up the pace here, I promise. Expiration. So, the expiration here is saying the expiration date of this contract will automatically extend to the closing date if the property is under contract. So, the idea of this section is what it's saying is, in the event we get the property, let's say we had done a six month listing, but the property didn't go under contract till five months into it, and it wasn't going to close until a week after our expiration date of this. This section is saying once the property goes under contract, we're agreeing our expiration date will automatically extend to closing if it is past the date we put up above in there in section one. Does that make sense? Okay. There used to actually be a company in town that, uh, and I don't know if you, you, you probably maybe know this, Daryl. At one point, though, there said if you do a price change, it automatically extends back to six months again, which I don't think was a very good idea because, to me, if the seller's unhappy with you, they're not going to change the price because it automatically extends your listing by six months. But anyway, but this is a good one. This is good because it. it you're covered for sure until closing is what this is saying, okay? Professional advice. Section seven, when I get to this section with a seller, so when I'm sitting down with a seller and I get to professional advice, what I tell them about this section is, this section says basically that I am, a, I am trained in the marketing of real estate and don't trust anything else that I tell you. I'm not an attorney, I'm not an accountant, I'm not a property inspector. So, and I usually will say it that way to be kind of funny, just in terms of, you know, don't trust anything that I tell you if it's about law, accounting, um, property inspection, <laughs> cook. That, I should start adding that. Cooking, <laughs> for sure. You know, all of those things. So, this is just saying I'm trained in the marketing of real estate. I'm not an expert in those areas. If you have questions about that, talk to an expert in that area. Because you'll get that a lot, especially in terms of accounting. Am I going to have to pay taxes on this? Well... Probably not, you know, depends on the scenario, but your answer needs to be, you know, really you should talk to your accountant to find that out, okay? So that's section seven says you don't know anything and don't trust you if you do say something, okay? And notice that, that they even put some of that section is in cap, all caps, you know, we want to scream it out to them, okay? All right, dispute resolution. Section eight there says that we're agreeing that prior to going to court that we would first go to mediation. So in terms of from between us and the client, we're agreeing to, that we're going to go to mediation first. Section 9 then says that in the event we end up in court, the prevailing party would be entitled to reasonable attorney's fees. So um, that lawsuit that uh, Rob was talking about on Tuesday, in the event that, that 
we were to win that suit, we are, this agreement would also be saying we wouldn't have to pay the attorney's pay fees. fees. Okay. That and we're going to win. <laughs> are we? I hope so. Like All right. Yeah, it makes sense. All right, section 10, advertising and seller authorization. So in this section is where the seller is giving us authorization here to um, advertise the property. They're giving us permission to put pictures on the MLS, uh, on the internet, to put a sign out front, um, and uh, also then, well, as you can see, the, the A, B, C, D, all that under section 10. To disclose to the MLS after closing the terms and the conditions of the sales price so we can disclose to the MLS. Why would we want that? Non-disclosure state, good. So because we're a non-disclosure state, we have to get permission in order to disclose that, okay? The other thing that's on here is where we got the square footage from. So the state of Utah requires that there's two places the seller has to disclose where the square footage came from. One of them is here, where's the other one? And it's not the MLS, because that's usually the first answer that people say. So, no, where the seller has to disclose to us, which they do through this form, where the square footage came from. Where else? There's a second place they have to disclose where they got the square footage. The seller disclosures. Seller disclosures. Good. Yeah. So the seller disclosures is the other place. So there's two places they have to disclose. A lot of times agents will put it on the MOS, which is fine, but that's not one of the required places that the division say. So, which is a little ironic because where do they typically get the square footage from? MLS. From who? Oh, seller. No, where does the seller usually get it from? From, yeah, from the county, but who usually gets it? I've never from been to a listing appointment yet where the seller says, I went to the county records and got you the square footage. Here it is. Where do they usually get it from? MLS. Well, from the, but the I'm obviously not asking this question right. <laughs> <laughs> so I, it. I know, I need to rephrase <laughs> it. Because they don't have access to the MLS, so they can't go to the MLS and get the square footage. Yeah, thank you. It's usually us as the agent yeah. giving it to oh, yeah. the seller, who then has to disclose to us where they got it from. Is that kind of... Yeah. I don't know. Again, obviously, it's just me. Never mind. <laughs> we'll move on. But... Yeah, so d typically they're going to have to disclose that. So it's either going to be county records or an appraisal. A lot of times if they've had an appraisal, that's what I will use as the square footage for the house is the appraisal that they had because an appraiser goes out and actually measures it. I've seen the tax records be wrong, so, or building plans as well. Okay, but I've also seen where they, it, I've seen where people have come and said, here's the flyer from the builder when we built the house, but then they added on two feet or they took off or whatever. So. So building plans could be okay, I mean, but it, kind of my preferred order, and, and this is just personal preference, so others may have difference, would be an appraisal first, then the county records, then the building plans, unless it's the actual building plans. If it's just a flyer, no. If it's the actual building plans, that'd probably be good as well. Um, one of my last listings, the lady had taken, uh, there had been a garage there before, one car garage, they'd taken and built it in for extra living space. Well, she'd take it and put it back as a garage, like the previous people. Oh, okay. Yeah. And so all of a sudden it went from county record for 1700 but it was actually 14 Gotcha. Yeah, because, yeah, thank you. Garage does not typically count unless they have finished it off and it's now usable, livable space. So it was before, but now it's not. Yeah. And I think in our case, we have a garage under our, like a, a dugout under our three-car garage. And because there's not an entrance for a car, it's considered part of our square footage. Oh, which okay. It really yeah. sucks because it's cold and cement down there. But I mean, it works great for storage. Do you have a batting stuff. cage in them? Well, you could. <laughs> you could. It's, my husband has his shop on one end oh, of right. storage, but we didn't know that. Because that's so, the only reason I could think of you build underneath mm -hmm. the ground. Well, when our square footage too. came back, it was a lot higher than we thought. Yeah, that's they were why, there. Because there's not an entrance, because there's steps going down, not yeah. a drive yeah. to get around yeah. there. Because we thought it was just considered a garage. Yeah. yeah. Nope, it's going to be, yep, you're exactly right. Okay, good. So the other things they're giving us permission to is obtain financial information from their lender, which typically you're not going to do that. If it's a short sale, then you may end up doing that, but typically you don't. Um, have keys to the property, have an MLS uh, key box that you're going to put on there, which also then uh, is talking to them about 
securing their things. So here's what I typically do with a seller when I get to this section is I will tell the seller, look, if you are worried about anything being stolen out of here with an agent coming through, you know, guns, jewelry, that kind of stuff, just get it out now. Yeah, get it locked up in a safe or get it moved to put take, put away whatever cuz we're not going to be responsible is basically what this is saying if if they if somebody were another agent were to come through and steal something. So this is kind of our safety net of we've let you know if you're concerned about that, get that stuff out. While I'm on that, the other thing that I always point out to them is the same thing and Rob mentioned this on Tuesday, but if you've got you know, this projector, if this projector really is special to me and I don't want to leave it behind, then let's replace it and put a new one there or just get rid of it right now. Because it is amazing how many times a buyer will come in and just because you want to take that, they want to negotiate to, well, I won't buy your house if you don't leave that in there. I mean, it's dumb, but I've seen it happen a lot. So if they're concerned about stuff like that, get it out now and replace it with one that they are willing to leave behind. You can buy that with the price of the home? You can do that, but the that problem is many yeah. buyers will come in and say, no, I just want you to include it. So yeah, you've said I can buy it, okay. but I don't want to buy it, just include it. And Rob it. was talking about the TV that's attached to the wall, and I was arguing, no, you, I mean, you take the TV, everybody takes TVs with them, but he says no because it's screwed into the wall, right? That's the argument, yeah. Is, yeah. is it or isn't it? So, so, but again, that's where, again, I would say, if, if it's on the wall like that and they don't want to include it, either take it off and have it sitting on top of a, a table. What's it called? <laughs> Mantle or something. Yeah, the uh, <laughs> entertainment center or something like that so that it's not questioned about it. Or replace it and put one that you will leave or something. So, because again, it's just you're going to negotiate it. But that kind of stuff, though, I can't tell you how many times I've seen like a, you go to list a property in the kitchen, they've got a a uh, shelf that they made, you know, and hung on the wall that they're like, well, I don't want to leave that. Well, then yeah, get it out now because I've seen where a buyer comes in and goes, oh, we love the shelf in there. And so what, here's our offer, but we want you to include the shelf too. I mean, seriously, that happens. So it's just better to say if you don't want to include it, get it out now. So that, because if the buyer never sees it, it's probably, that probably didn't make or break if they wanted to buy the house. But it'll make or break the deal when it comes to negotiating. I've seen where they, oh, I absolutely, I won't buy it. So, okay. Uh, this also gives us permission to hold open houses, place signs on the property, order a home warranty if applicable, and then to communicate with the seller for the purpose of soliciting real estate. That's to overcome the do not call list. If they're on the do not call list, they're giving us permission to talk to them. And that we can put the earnest money into an interest bearing trust account, uh, which would then go to benefit the UAR Hoff, which I don't believe we actually do that, but we have permission to do it, but I don't think we actually do it. So, um, And then this also gives us permission for two other things. So um, on L and M, L says when the property is pending or under contract, seller instructs the seller's agent to not present any more offers or allow any more showings. Why would we want that on there? Okay, good. Yeah, because what, and, and again, this is probably doesn't happen as much right now, but when, when we had a lot of short sales going on, this could be something that would come up quite often. But remember in school you learned any offer that you get that's in writing, you have to present to your seller, right? So this though is the seller is now telling us if that, if you get another offer in writing, don't give it to me. So they're telling us, instructing us here not to bring them other offers. So Even if it's better. Even if it's, well, yes, that's what this is instructing us, is not to bring them any other. And but again, you bring that to their attention. Well, Maybe because let's talk it. about real quick, now sh let's not include short sales in this discussion. If I have an offer and it's under contract, so Carl's my seller, I've got an offer, it's, we're now under contract on his property, and Daryl comes in and brings me a higher offer, what can Carl do about that? Well, if it's already a contract that's... Right under contract and it's been signed. That's so so my question for the seller is, do you, would you really want to know that no. Daryl's brought me as an offer that's going to net you more money, but you can't get out of the first one? No. No, I've got a brother who's a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I'd rather not give that that Okay. So that's the point of that is just, you know, most sellers, if you told them, look, if you, do you really want to know if you could have got more money, but 
You're not going to be able to? No, they don't want to know that. Okay, so <laughs> that's why. Okay, and then M is in the event a buyer's agent requests to present an offer in person to the seller, the seller gives us written authorization to tell them basically, no, we're not going to let you come present the offer. Or really it's to let us just decide if we want to let them. Now, when I first started 20 years ago, and Daryl, you'll probably remember this too, is we used to present every offer. You, every offer, you would write it. I would call up and say, hey, Steve, I've got an offer on your listing. When can I come over and present it? We would go over to their house. We would sit down. I would hand a copy of the offer to Steve to, re to review it. And then I would start talking to the seller about, let me tell you about my buyers. They're just the nicest people. They loved your backyard. They love what you did the flower, with the flower bed. And they could just picture their kids back there playing in the backyard. And I'm trying to get them to want the, my buyers to have their house. And then we would present the offer. So this is saying that in the event somebody asks to do that, we get to decide if we want to let them or not. Okay. Yeah. I think Mark Ulrich would pretty much put a picture of the family and it's on a stand <laughs> right in front of the people. <laughs> This is Jimmy. Yeah. Uh, this is Alice. Yeah, they're, they're waiting outside the car right now with their bags packed. Yeah, we would, <laughs> and we would a lot of times have the, the buyers. There were some good things to this because we would have the buyers out in the car sitting out there, and you could usually negotiate and put the deal together like right then. It wasn't like waiting, so like we have to do sometimes now. So yeah, that was a good point. Because typically you would, you'd leave and then they would sit and dis discuss it and give a counter, walk out to the car and hand it to you and then you could talk about it and go back in and present your counter or whatever. But anyway, this gives us permission to decide one way or the other. Do we want to do that or not? Okay, so it's up to you. All right, next, personal property. Seller authorizes and acknowledges that, oh, this is regarding what we, I've talked about before. So even though I talked about it up there, this is action actually is where it's saying is if you've got personal property in there, it's your responsibility to safeguard it, your guns, your jewelry, your drugs, all that kind of stuff. Okay. Legal drugs, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> oh boy. All right. Uh, section 12 is attachment. So this is saying there either is a, um, an addendum to this or there's not. So you're going to check there are or not. When would we do, I already gave you one example, but ultimately what sometimes agents will want to do is just cross stuff out on here. The, the real appropriate way that you should do it is to do it on an addendum. So if you were going to, let's say, so let's use this example Stephanie had. I took this contract out there and it says 7% on it, but let's say that they negotiated me to go down to 6.5%. Well, we don't have a contract that says six and a half. The, the ideal way we should do it is check that there is an addendum, and then on the addendum put commission to be six and a half percent is where we should put it. A lot of times agents will just cross it out here and initial it and, and stuff, which you'll probably fly, but that's, in terms of like legal situations, you're better off putting it on an addendum, okay? Okay, so is it three and a half and three and a half, or is it, however you determine it because right now I've got four on one house and three to the agent. That's how I would probably do it. So you can decide. You could offer three and a half. We have an agent that is up in the Centerville office. I don't think he's still doing this, but for a long time he did only 8% listings and he would offer five to whoever brought the buyer in. Anybody want to show his houses? That's yeah. that's you, want to, yeah. you want to take him an offer? Now you know why he did it. So. Oh, who is he? What? Who is it? Uh, you're in Centerville. Come on, yeah. help me out. He's door knocks all the time. Uh, uh, Trent. Trent Hyde. Yeah, Trent. That's yeah, Trent Hyde. Trent. Yeah. I don't know if he still does it. You have to ask him. But okay. in fact, ask him, and then he'll, he, if he's not, he'll say, "I need to start doing that again." I promise you, because <laughs> he he swore by it. I, I think I would do eight percent and offer four and keep four if it were me. But yeah. he offered five and and. Every one of you would be happy to go show his Story listing. Right? Interest oh, in yeah, other absolutely. agents. All right, so that's attachment. Fifth, uh, 13 is equal housing opportunity. This is just saying that as you, we present the property, we're going to follow all the fair housing laws. Okay. So in terms of, we'll have a whole separate discussion on fair housing on the very last class. Which, by the way, the, on the 22nd, that class, it, we're going to be playing Jeopardy for that class. I mean, that, that whole two hours, we're playing a game. So when I said you're going to be tested on this stuff, it's part of Jeopardy, okay? We're going to break up into We're going to have fun. Okay? Can have notes? You can have notes if you want. Yeah. So, all right. I know I shouldn't have told you that those were some of the answers now. Huh? All right. 
you're going to have an initial this and then the next page, is page three of this, is electronic transmissions and counterparts. So on this we're just agreeing that we can use electronic transmission. We can email, we can fax, we could uh, do any of those type of things. And we could do it at counterparts. What does counterparts mean? Okay, so what counterparts would be is let's say that I had this document. Now, dot loop has kind of fixed this a lot, but prior to dot loop, what would happen is maybe you would email or you would fax to the husband and to the wife. So she's at work, he's at work. You'd fax it to both of them. They would both sign, and then it would come back to, to, to you. So even though they're not on the exact same piece of paper, they're on, the same, they're on copies of the same document. That's what counterparts are. So we're agreeing that that's okay. They don't have to be on the exact same document. Now, dot loop fixes that because even though they're both signing at separate times, it drops their signatures under the one spot. So that's kind of the nice thing. So. But that's what that's saying. So in the event you ever did have to email it to them and they signed it and sent it back, that would be okay. Due on sale clause. What, so first, what is due on sale clause? What does that mean? That if the house is sold, you have to pay them the remainder of the Okay, good, yeah, so the, the mortgage would have to be paid off. Okay, good. When else would it? Because there's more than just if it, the property is sold. There's other times, too. Taxes aren't paid. Yeah, I guess if, if, uh, the, if they were to do a tax lien, it'd go, yeah. What else? When the lender says, we want it all right now. And why would they say that to you? Because you oh. yeah, you, uh, Good. Yeah, so... In the event, if you were to go do seller financing on this property, you run the risk. So really, the purpose of this section really only applies on a seller. The only reason they need to be aware of this is if they're going to do a lease option or if they're going to do seller financing. If they're going to do either of those, make sure they understand this due on sale clause. And same with your buyer. They need to understand this due on sale clause. That what it's saying is, if in the event you were to go do seller financing, you run the risk that what's going to happen is the bank is going to call your note due and payable and if that happens it could put the buyer in a position of basically losing the property because of this due on sale clause. Okay. So yeah, it's important that they understand how that works. Now, the nice thing is it's not like banks are out looking for people to go foreclose on, but they could, you know, and if, if some uh, punk kid at the bank decided he wanted to try to make a name for himself, he could say, I'm going to go find out all these things and I'm going to make, you know, make myself look good to the bank. I mean, it's not like the bank wants the property back, typically, but it, it is a risk and they just need to be aware that that is a risk that could come into play. So, okay. Uh, 16. Foreign Investment and Real Property Tax Act. What is that? Somebody that's out in the U.S. that wants to purchase. Okay. But that, which is fine. They can do that. They could come in and purchase the house. But why does the seller need to know or care? We need to know if it's a company or a person or what was it? I can't remember now. Okay, so really what this is, is this is more for the, as the seller, if they were a foreign investor when they bought the house. So years ago, I had a client that, that contacted me online. Uh, well, it hasn't been a client, it was a lead. It contacted me, wanted to buy this house. Said he was coming from Cambodia he was going to pay cash and all the money was going to come from, I mean, it was one of those where I, I was like nervous the whole time that like, I hope this is real, but it might not be real. And so I'll be careful with it. And even when I took the offer to the agent, the listing agent was like, is this real? And I was like, oh yeah, it's totally real. And inside I was like, I don't know. It's still. <laughs> I really don't know. We'll find out if the money really shows you up. You sound like the kid. <laughs> well, I, I had the, the buyer give me even a letter from a bank, but it was from a bank in Cambodia, so I don't know if it was really a bank. I mean, it had letters. So on did it pan out? It did. It worked out. It closed. Everything was great. But here's the thing. Came time to sell for them, which, which again, I was, this even made me nervous, because after they'd been in the house only a few months, this buyer called me and said, hey, we now want to sell this place. We're thinking we want to buy something else. And I was thinking, wow, this may be a way to launder money in is yeah. because it was cash to purchase it. They could sell the house now and turn around and do it. Well, so that was kind of the point of this whole uh, Foreign Investment Real Property Tax Act. So this FERPTA is what you'll hear it referred to as, as FERPTA, Foreign Investment and Real Property Tax Act. 
what happened is really it was an amendment. In 2008, they did an amendment to this where what they said is if the seller is a foreign investor, meaning like so my client that I was talking about came in and bought this house, if they turn around and decide to sell the house, they have to give to the buyer, now follow me on this because this gets a little tricky and doesn't make a whole lot of sense, but it's the IRS, so what do you expect, right? So if the seller decides to sell the house, they have to give to the buyer or to what they called an intermediary, which would be, so in this case, a title company. They have to give to them either their tax ID number, so they have to either give it to the buyer or to the title company. If they don't do that, so if the seller were not to do that and they sold the house and didn't pay taxes on it, the buyer is responsible to pay the taxes on that gain that the seller had. One way or the How other. does that make sense, One right? If you, if you as the buyer go buy the house but the seller made all this money, you get to pay the taxes for the seller if they didn't give to the title company or to your buyer the tax ID number. Now we don't ever want to give to, so when you're representing a seller in this scenario, basically when I get to this section, what it's what I tell them is this is saying that we either need to check yes or no, that, or is or is not that you are a foreign person as defined by the IRS. If you are, great, we need to get a forwarding address here and you'll need to give to the title company a tax ID number. So what if they don't have one? Yeah, if they're that, a foreign person. Then they need to go they and get one them? in order to, they, you can get a tax ID. It won't be a social security number, it'll be a tax ID number that they can then, as long as that happens, the buyer is safe. Oh, so it's the same thing, just it's the same thing. Yeah, but it, it, by doing that, your buyer's now safe and doesn't have to pay that. Now, that really actually happened up in Park City a few years ago where the title company didn't do that. And, and I don't know why the title company ended up paying other than probably the title insurance maybe was what kicked in. The title company ended up paying $35,000 on behalf of the buyer for that. So, James? I would think the broker here should require, if this box to check is, that they not only provide the TIN number, but also give the actual document, supply a copy of the document. Because as far as we know, you know, they could just be making it up and writing something in. Well, so but that's the nice thing is though is the buyer's not responsible to verify it. They just have to as long as the seller has given them here's the here's my tax. How do they, I, I'm just thinking full, you know, pro, proactive of the IRS and um, you know. So what, which you bring up a very good point. That's why to me. Always have them give it to the title company, not to your buyer, because then it's on the title company to go verify not your buyer or you. Okay. All right. So that's FERPTA. Okay. So if side. you are a foreign person, then you have to. We fill want out a forwarding address. address. Yep. If they're not, we don't need the forwarding okay. address. Okay. All right. Seventeen is authorizations to furnish the TILA RESPA integrated disclosure. So again, this for this got added to our listing agreement just about a little over a year ago. And the reason for that is, again, this is back to government, uh, ironic stuff. So according to the federal government, they're saying you as an agent do not have the right to see the closing disclosure without permission. So we added this to give us permission to do it. Which So the federal law says you don't have a right to see it, yet if you remember from real estate school, when you went to real estate school, they told you you have it, the state of Utah expects you to review the settlement statement prior to closing. So the state law says you should be re uh, reviewing the document, but federal law now, a year ago, changed it to say you don't have a right to see it. Isn't that funny? Yeah. So how we get around that is this authorization. So because of signing this, the seller is authorizing us to see that closing disclosure. So if you ever have a title company tell you, I can't send it to you without permission, send them a copy of your listing agreement and that they now in section 17, the seller has given us permission to see that integrated disclosure, okay? All right, 18 is this is the entire agreement. There's not anything that's, that's left out. And, and so specifically is if you had been advertising saying, if you list your house with me, I'll buy you a TV. If it's not, what this section 18 is saying is if it's not in the contract, it's not part of the deal, okay? So if you did advertise something like that, make sure you put it in an addendum or something. Okay. All right, and then seller's going to sign, 
and you are going to sign as the authorized agent. So you are now all authorized to sign this, okay? And initial. All right, any other questions on the listing group? Yes, Jim. Yeah, back on 17 here, Bob, it, isn't there a line on the seller's sell, on the settlement statement for the broker to sign or the agent or both no. that they have to sign? No, they do have your information on there now. Yeah. So that it's got your license number, your name, your phone number, all that yeah. kind of stuff. But that, you don't you know, have to use it that since the federal ruling, you no longer have to, or is it your? We've your never had to. Never had it. No. Okay. Yeah. No, we never had to. Okay, so I got a question too. So if everybody's got signatures on everything, do they get copies of any of this? Great or question. Does this whole thing go to the office? Great question. You should give copies of everything your client signs to them. You should give a copy to them. So I have as to make, as go back as soon and as you make can. a copy of this and then give it back to them, a copy of it? Yeah, if you sign it in person, if you did it through dot loop, they now have a copy that they could print out on their own. But yeah, if you were, if I was, if you were Do sitting down with me and I had signed it, you should go back to your office, make a copy and email it to them. Or take it to them, whatever. But yeah, they need to have copies of everything they sign. Okay. All right, next form. The next form is the MLS data input sheet, which, oh, I forgot. I was going to update it. It's a Brent, if you print it off the MLS now, it looks different. The data is still essentially everything's the same, but it looks different now. And I was going to update it and I forgot. So, but this gives you a copy, but it's going to look a little different now when you go to print it, but it's essentially the same information. Okay? Just a lot more pages. What's that? Just a lot more yeah, there's a, yeah they've, they've made it bigger and it takes up a lot more space, yeah. So, but here's the main thing. On this, what you need to know in terms of filling out this MLS data input sheet. If you look up there at the top left where it has list price and then it's got an asterisk after it, anything on this form that has an asterisk is required. You have to have the answer to that question to put it on the MLS. The MLS will not let you publish it without all the ones that have an asterisk. If there's not an asterisk, you would be fine putting it on without it. So if you don't know, you could put it on without, okay? But anything with an asterisk is required. So take a look real quick, just in, for the interest of time. Look through that and see if there's anything on this page that you have questions on. There's like three that almost always come up, so if you don't ask, I'll answer those three. But there could be more than three. I have a weird question. Okay. So on, I just listed a lot of, for a friend of mine. The irregular shape, is that just if it's like, the sides aren't the same, or like, how do you? What I don't does know. that mean exactly? For me, what it means, and I don't know that this is right, but for me, it means if it's not a square or a rectangle. Right. If it's anything else, then I'd say it's, it's irregular. Okay. Because yeah. that's what I put. Because yeah. it's a little, but I wasn't. I'm like, oh, yeah. If if yeah, it if it's any shape but a square or a rectangle. Nobody's giving a definite answer at this point. Yeah. Exactly. So in a cul-de-sac in the back, pie shape. That's then irregular. I would probably. Because the front's smaller yeah, than the probably. back. Or if it has an option. I, I guess actually, as you say that, no, I would probably, in a cul-de-sac, I probably would still call that regular because that's going to be, yeah. I guess think of it as if it's normal to what you would so typically you're talking see. About, like, yeah, I'm just saying okay. if it's kind of really yeah. weird. I would just and say if to you it seems kind of out of the norm, then I would say it's irregular. Okay. Any boundary that has an obtuse angle in Yeah, probably. Yeah. Sounds good. We'll have you write that definition there. Okay. You sure it's not you that's the attorney? All right. <laughs> what else? All right, well, I'll just answer it for you then, because you guys have to look like, just tell us. We don't really care. Right? <laughs> just get it over with. All right. So the, the ones that usually come up that, that agents will ask is, so looking here underneath this bold black line here, where it's got the uh, levels and things, a lot of times people will ask on bath, the F, T, and H, what's F? Full. T? Three quarters. Three quarters. So we lost yeah. about half the group on that one. Okay, good. And the H? Uh, okay, good. You all came back. Good. So, yeah, so that's what what would define as one as being a three quarter, though? Shower. shower. Okay, good. All right. And then on the kitchen, you got K, B, F, and S. What are those? What's K? So to the right of where the bath was, the kitchen dining. What's K? Okay, good. B? Bath. What? Bath. Bath? Is that what you said? 
That's no, basement. No, 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 it's not basement. It's bar. Breakfast nook? Yeah, it would be a breakfast nook or a bar is typically what it is. If there's an island bar or the snack bar kind of a thing, that's what it's. That's what that be is. More is, is there an island snack bar or is it a, just a regular, what do you call the regular one? It's not an island, just a bar. A bar. Sure. Yeah. And then F? Full, formal. Formal. And S? Semi-formal. Semi so what's the definition, what's the difference between a formal and a semi-formal? So, so typically that's how I think about formal dining is going to be a separate room. I usually think of it as, as it's got three walls surrounding just the dining area. I mean, which I said that one time and somebody's like, well, every room's got three walls surrounding it. But, but like meaning surrounding only the dining area, which is what I would define that as formal. If it's got less than that, then I would say it's a semi formal. So, but typically, just think of it as if it's a separate space, you can probably put it down as formal. Okay. So semi formal can be in that kitchen great room. That's what I would call semi formal. Semi formal. Yeah. Yep, I'd put that as semi formal. Up. So it's not called a kitchen or a breakfast area. But it could have. So yeah, great point. On this, it's possible that you have every one of those checked. On the main floor. On the yeah, whichever floor it's on, yeah. Okay, the other things that usually come up on here is um, under uh, listing type. So the kind of the bottom left under the listing office location down there, listing type. There's E A L and E R S. Which one do we check? E R S. Good. What's E A L? Exclusive agency. Good job. Exclusive agency listing, which means what? Isn't that where if you have buyer come to the seller that you wouldn't have to get a commission? Yeah, so essentially what the exclusive agency is saying is that I'm the only one that can get paid. So you, if I listed one and did it as exclusive agency listing, you can't, none of you could bring a buyer to that property. Only I can bring the buyer. So typically when you do that, you're not also not going to put it on the MLS. So if you do an exclusive agency. So sometimes we will do an exclusive agency listing for a period of time, meaning you'll go out and get the papers signed, and while we're waiting to get pictures back, it's we there's a separate form that you do that's a notice of exclusive listing that just says you've explained the benefits of it, but the seller's choosing choosing not to put it on the MLS. And then once you get the pictures, then you go ahead and put it on the MLS. Is an exclusive agency also where you list it anyone from your office can bring it on? Yeah. I don't I don't yeah. think that I think maybe you, yeah, I think you might be right. That the brokerage maybe yeah. I'll have to double check that. I can't remember. I'll double check that. I don't remember. All right. The other thing that sometimes comes up is BAC. What's BAC? Buyer agent. Okay, good. That's where you know how much you're going to get paid. And do we do gross or net? Typically, I would say do gross. Why? What is the difference between the gross and net, though? If we say that. This was check net, though. I, I know. I, actually, there's a couple of things on here that I noticed that I'm like, why did I do that? But, I tried to throw you off by checking that here. Isn't the net exclusions and include or like So the concession. So you so the difference between gross and net is gross is you're getting paid the commission, the three percent or whatever is gonna be based off the total purchase price. Net would be it's the purchase price minus any concessions. So
the buyer moves in and the neighbor and says, so what do you do every spring? What do, you, what do they do about every spring when it floods the basement because of that, you know? So. Okay. Through and check the boxes and just tell them on dot loop and then I Uh, section 19, other moisture conditions, probably. I don't is know that exactly. Flooding? If it, if the toilet I mean, I for, again, for me, if they said that, I would say disclose yeah, it. Disclose, disclose it. Because, again, the worst thing that can happen for you as an agent is they say the toilet overflowed. I mean, it's the toilet overflow. I mean, it was whatever. And you say no, and then it turns out there's a bigger problem. Right. It's worse. So I have a good friend that's an attorney, and he's actually a real estate attorney. He was selling his house, and the buyer said he found out before he had given them the seller disclosures that they said they were not going to do any inspections at all. He said, whoa. I mean, he didn't say this to them, but inside he was like, I'm totally redoing my seller disclosures then. And he said, I went through and I disclosed. He said, I disclosed every little thing, even something like that. I mean, I might be a little bit out there of this. But he's like, I disclosed everything. It, you know, that there's cracks in the stucco, there's a nick on the walls, there's the, and the reason he said is because once you've disclosed it, it's now all the responsibilities on the buyer. Meaning like if so he said he did that, so if the buyer ever tried to come back on him for something, it, so really like let's say that I had put down this thing on here and there turned out to be a problem but with this wall, but it was clear down here at the thermostat. Essentially, what he was saying is, by because he disclosed it, a judge would look at it and say, well, they told you that there was a mark on the wall. Why didn't you try to figure out what was going on with the whole wall? So that's why, really, sellers should not look at the disclosures as like a scary bad thing. Look at it as, it, the more you tell them, they can never come back and sue you for it. I've only had, in 20 years, I've been one time, one of my transactions ended up in small claims court. and. I always tell the sellers, these seller disclosures are going to either hang you or set you free. And, and my client ended up having to go to court, and which and it's a whole, I, I'll save you the details of it because we've got four minutes to finish. But <laughs> for her, this saved her because they were suing her saying she didn't disclose that there had been water in the basement and that they, they some tree roots had grown into the sewer. And they said, they wanted her to be responsible to pay for that. I, she called me and said, hey, I got this notice. I'm supposed to go to court. What do I do? I said, let's get your seller disclosures. Hopefully you put it on there. And we looked. Sure enough, she had disclosed on there about the basement having flooding. I told her, when you get to court, I said, I don't think the judge will want to hear anything from me because the contract's between buyer and seller, not me. But I said, just hand him the seller disclosures and show him right here we disclosed that we had had water in the basement. She did that. The judge looked at it and said to the buyers, this your initials? Yeah. Well, they told you right here. Why are, he was like, why are we even here? They told you. Well, but there was tree roots that grow, grew into the sewer. He's like, that happens on my street every year somebody does that. Welcome to home ownership. Yeah, I mean, it was kind of like, deal with it. Sorry. So they, that's what I tell the sellers. These seller disclosures, if you end up in court, you're going to be grateful you disclosed or you're going to wish you had. So disclose, disclose, disclose. Okay? And you think about it. Let's say that I had had uh, the toilet overflowed. If, if I put on there the toilet overflowed, here's what we did to fix it, it totally puts every issue onto the buyer at that point. Because if they came back and there turned out to be a problem that really wasn't even necessarily related to that, it's a good chance that you could say, well, had you, the judge might say, well, had you checked it out to find out why that 
I, a buyer, for me as a buyer's agent, if I get a seller disclosures that's perfect, the seller's lived in the house for 30 years and they've never had any issues, that's more scary to me than the one who says, here's the, because I can pretty much guarantee everybody's had a sink that's overflowed, uh, the, the, your clothes washer hose came out, you know, and it flooded, I mean, something has happened. So to me, I just tell the seller, I'm more scared when there's not anything because what are they not telling us? Versus if you if 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 they're willing to say we had this nick here, my boys were fighting and they put a hole in the wall, but we fixed it. The, you know, and they maybe don't have to be that technical. Technical, but if they ask, I would say yes, do it. Make sense. So if you're a buyer's agent and you do receive the seller's disclosure and. You me as I as an agent spot something on it. Do I bring it to the attention of my buyer or just let the buyer kind of spot it themselves? Because I was told not to say anything. So you should give it to them and let them review it and then just say, you know, let me know if you have any questions, any concerns, anything like that. So it's a little bit on that. I mean, if you saw something that was like a major, you know, the house is going to fall down in two years, you might want to talk to him about it. I don't know. But the thing in value. But, but it is, you got to be a little careful on that be, just because is it subjective or not? If it's just your opinion of, oh, that would scare me, but other people it doesn't, then, you know, so you got to be a little. But cause part of why I say that is other agents, agents get in the way of deals happening because they, they jump in and go, oh, you know, you shouldn't, you should, oh, I wouldn't buy the house with that or whatever. I mean, let them decide if, you know, and again, because remember, I'm trained in the marketing of real estate. You're not a property inspector. You're not all those things. So don't try to be that. So, okay. Next page is just the addendum. So if they run out of room explaining something, they can put it on the addendum. And then finally is lead-based paint disclosure, which... What page are you on? Very last. Is lead-based paint disclosure. The only thing I'm going to... We'll talk about this on third next Thursday because we're doing buyer packet and this will be in there again then so I'm going to keep it brief today since we're out of time but on Thursday I'll spend a little more on it. Lead based paint disclosure, when do we use it? So if the home was built in 1978 do I need it? So we do not, if it's in 78 we don't need it, it's prior to 78. Now would it hurt if you did it? No. In fact, banks on foreclosures, they'll do a lead-based paint disclosure on a home that was built last year because they just want, so it's not going to hurt to do it, but it's only required prior to 1978. So 77 or over. We'll go through the rest of it on next Thursday. So next Tuesday's class then is going to be the CMA. What, what my plan with that as we do the CMA class is, is I'm going to go through, the, as part of the division for the 12-hour new agent class, they want you to understand the difference between an appraisal and a CMA. So we'll spend some time on that. But then I'm going to go through how do you do a CMA kind of the basic way, the, the standard way that everybody does it. And I want to try to go kind of fast through that because I'd like to spend most of the time, if we can, on I have kind of an advanced way. And when I say advanced, don't let it scare you. But it's, it's a better way, I think, of coming up with it. You still do the standard way, but I like using this other way. And, and, and if we get time, I'll get into that on Tuesday. Tuesday. That's Tuesday. At 10? At 10 o'clock. And then Thursday will be the buyer packet where we'll do basically the same thing we did today, but with the buyer side of stuff. So. Okay. So cool. Okay. That's Have CME a great... The best, right? What? That CME class is the best one. Well, I don't know. <laughs> we'll see. I'll, you can tell me after. So. Anyway, thanks for being here. Thank Have you. a great day. We'll see you Tuesday. And did everybody get this? Anybody not? Okay. Awesome. I know, right? But it's asleep. I can just switch it up. I was like, this is not like gosh. Yeah. Storm's coming in. My knee's coming in. Is that it? Your arthritis is is creeping up. Yeah, it is. With the with the weather and all that. It's the chair. Blame the chairs. They're oh like, my god. I know they are. My butt feels like it's square. I, 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 I know. I hate <laughs> I hate sitting there too. Yeah. Well, thanks Russ. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, you can't show up at the end of class, dude. Come on. I'm just I'm actually on my way out the door. I have another question for you. What would be a reasonable earnest money amount for like a one point three? 
for 1.3. So typically for me, once I get up to about 500,000, I usually tar start to say think in terms of 1%. Yeah. But even, and actually for like even a 1.3 million, they may even want to do. They want to do 2.5. I was going to say 20. Is that reasonable? Yeah. Okay. I just wanted to you know, be able to say to my client, yes, I'm confident that this is reasonable. Yeah, I mean, 25 might be a little high, but 20, I, I was, if, had you not said anything, I would have said 20. in that price range, 20, you know, somewhere between 10 and 20 for sure, so. Okay. So if they're wanting 25, maybe just do 20. I mean, they're serious about buying the house anyway, yeah. so. Okay. That's, that's awesome. a good lead. Yeah, that was a really good one. Yeah. So. Is it just one of the internet ones? Yeah, it was one that Josh gave me. Uh, this lady's moving from Georgia. I was talking to her for about four months. Oh. And she flew in a couple weeks ago when we went up. We were looking at Suncrest area. And then, yeah, we That's found cool. one that they really liked. So, so is she cash or is she going to loan? She's going to get a loan for it. Good. And she's all approved and everything? Good. Yeah. That's good. She, actually, she actually works for the bank. She's like one of the big wigs at oh. um, SunTrust Bank. Do you know SunTrust? I've heard of them, yeah. yeah. Huh. That's so. cool. Well, that's awesome. Yeah, it'll be good, but we're just kind of coming up with the game plan for our offer. Because yeah, they can't probably. move, they can't move until March. So they're just saying, like, hey, you know, we want to be under contract. Oh, we're not in a big hurry. To close till March? Yeah, they don't want to close till oh, March. But in that scenario, 25 might yeah, make sense. We're going to take it off the market for yeah. so long. 25 would make more sense yeah. to me, yeah. though. So but once you tell me that, I'm like, they're yeah, saying we want at least 25 non refundable. Yeah. So. And I, I would probably say, I would, if they're expecting them to wait that long, I mean, you might want to. Well, I don't know. I guess if your client's good with doing the non-refundable, if they're that you know committed to it, uh -huh. then I would I would maybe say to, for it to be non make it non-refundable after due diligence. That's what. So, well, okay. we're doing non-refundable all the way up until financing. Okay, good. I was gonna say if you could just get like financing, a normal, just like a yeah. normal transaction. Oh, well, then yeah, then yeah, then it's yeah, no, that's not a big. I just don't want to say put twenty five thousand dollars in the pot yeah. when well, really does, only they need yeah. another ten. That does make sense though if you're asking them to wait. A long time to close. That yeah. probably does make sense. So. Okay. Cool. Awesome. Awesome. I talked to uh, talked to a builder. Yeah. And he said that that price is is really nice, but he said that price is pretty ridiculous. Is it? Okay. Yeah. He's like any educated builder wouldn't spend more than three hundred on it. And did you say even if you could subdivide it and build two? He said by the time you subdivided that one and did all the utilities and pipes and sewer everything like that. Said so you're just going to be way over unless okay. you're planning on oh. selling the house. So that's why I, it, it really makes me feel like who have the the hearsay in the neighborhood about what they sold it for is probably not true. That's what that's what I think. Yeah. That's what I thought since day one. Yeah, I, that's why if there was a way to try to figure it out, like by going and finding whoever did yeah, it. Yeah, well, I talked to him. I said, how hard it would how hard would it be to give me the contact information from the people that did it in the first place? Yeah. So I guess I'll see what they say. See what they say. Yeah, because that's just it. If you could figure that out. He'll, he'll tell you, I can pay that much for it. I'll pay, you know, and even if he's lying, even if he's saying, that was only 350 or whatever, yeah. you'd be like, okay, well, good. Yeah, well, like, my, my main thing is just having to put my sign in the yard, be able to get some business off of that, yeah. and then also, you know, once they realize that it's kind of unrealistic, what they're wanting, then they'll be like, okay, well, let's just sell the house for what it's worth. Yeah. And then we can just move forward. Because they know it'll sell fast. All those bungalows and sugar house, that have oh, sold. Yeah. They're selling for oh, like yeah. anywhere between four ten to four fifty, but they're complete flips. Yeah. They've been they totally new yeah, yeah, exactly. Completely. So, so did, that's does, what they're gonna do. They're gonna sell it for three fifty. A little better split on that high of a price or not? On what? Oh, the big if, one. But she writes the deal. Do you get to keep a little bit more, or is it still? The it's number? a sixty. It's a sixty four. <laughs> it's still the same. I I wish it. Which no, it, it makes sense because but, it's like. If I were him, I would say, well, if you do them for under 100000 do I get to keep more of that then? Yeah, <laughs> you know? exactly. I know. We, we can't be greedy. We no. just have to be no, grateful for what we have. Oh, heck yeah, for sure. So. It's awesome. It's awesome. Cool. Do you. you get my text? Uh, and I, well, I don't know. I, uh, oh. I haven't seen it yet. Why? What's oh. up? You can just cross my name off that list. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, okay. No worries. I think I have a deal that's falling through. Oh, do you? Yeah. Well, why? It's complicated, but my buyer's going through, well, he just finished a bankruptcy. Oh, okay. And so we got the seller to extend twice already for that bankruptcy. Yeah. But she's already like, you know, like, you didn't.